The last time we stopped at verse 2, uh, sorry, chapter 2, verse 18, and the very last words of that verse are, Therefore fight, O descendant of Bharata. This is not Krishna encouraging violence. This is with reference to the inner journey, the internal battle over our own negative qualities, our negative habit patterns, and therefore fight, O descendant of Bharata. This phrase comes again and again. It is repeated throughout the text, encouraging a sadhaka, a meditator, a seeker, not to give up, not to give in to our own negative habit patterns. Don't be defeated. Don't give in to fatalism. Don't get discouraged. Whatever happens, ultimately, you are eternal. Nobody dies. Only the body is perishable. External objects are perishable. But the one who knows, who witnesses, he is established in his self. That's Sutra 1.3. The self is established in the self. One who is established in the self does not experience the fear of death because he knows that he is eternal and immortal. We continue then with verse 13. Sorry, 19. Misreading numbers today. Verse 19 says, He who thinks the embodied one to be a slayer and he who thinks the embodied one to be slain, neither of them knows correctly. The embodied one neither kills nor is he killed. He is never born nor does he die. Nor having been does he ever again cease to be. Unborn, eternal, perennial, This ancient one is not killed when the body is killed. He who knows this as imperishable, eternal, unborn, unalterable, how can that person, O son of Pritha, kill? And whom can he kill or cause to be killed? In these verses from 19 to 21, Sri Krishna gives us a beautiful contrast of avidya and vidya, that which is ignorance and that which is true knowledge. In verse 19, he says, the one who who thinks that the embodied one is a slayer, the one who thinks that this embodied one can be slain, this is Ignorance. He does not know or does not have correct knowledge. This is not true knowledge. The embodied one can neither kill nor be killed. If you think that you are a slayer, you can slay somebody or you can kill somebody or be killed yourself, then you are ignorant. That is ignorance. Definition of ignorance. Avidya. Then he goes on to explain in verse 20. He is never born, nor does he die. He has never ceased to be. He always is. And this is true knowledge. You are unborn, you are eternal, you are perennial. The body may be killed, but you cannot be killed. This is true knowledge. So in two paragraphs, he gives us, Sri Krishna gives us this beautiful contrast between Vidya and Avidya.
He who knows this as imperishable, eternal, unborn, unalterable. How can that person kill and whom can he kill or cause to be killed? One who is established in his self cannot kill. This is where we differentiate between Ahimsa and Avidya, uh, Advaita. Sorry. Ahimsa is often sort of, you know, explained to people as non-violence. And people accept this as a kind of a rule. So you think because you are practicing yoga, you must practice ahimsa, which means you think you need to practice being nice to people or become a vegetarian, whatever your idea of non-violence may be. Whatever limited idea we have, we then practice that. For a lot of people, this means becoming vegetarian. This is ahimsa. Well, there's a fine difference here. Understanding that everybody or every being, every life form has a jiva, has atman, is conscious, has life and has the right to live, gives us this insight that we are all one and the same. Our, our true nature is the same. The true nature of an animal is the same as the true nature of a human being, is pure consciousness. When you have that insight, you cannot kill. Yet, at the same time, it doesn't mean that you have to become a vegetarian. This is the law of life. Ultimately, we do need to survive. Plants also have life, also have consciousness. It is a different kind of consciousness from ours. We distinguish between the forms of consciousness as tamasic, rajasic and sattvic. Among all living creatures or beings, we have a sattvic consciousness. Animals are said to have a rajasic consciousness. Plants, for example, have more tamasic consciousness. So the quality of consciousness may differ, but it is consciousness all the same. So what shall we do? Shall we stop eating? No, that's not possible. That would also be violence. So you see, logically speaking, that's not possible for you to be really non-violent. Your very existence becomes a form of violence in that case, if you think in this manner. But if you are established in the self and you see everything as change, you know that nothing really dies, you will have respect for life and you will only take that what you need. Not this senseless slaughter of animals that we sometimes know from mass production of, you know, uh, meat, etc., which is uh, uh, so senseless. One, is, one even says that if you take a fish, you know, directly out of the, the water, I mean, out of a lake or, or, or the ocean, and eat it, that is sattvic. It's been free, it's lived a free life, and if you take it out and you eat it, it is considered to be sattvic. So when you are established in this state of Advaita, you really understand what ahimsa means. Until then, ahimsa becomes a rule that you impose on yourself. So we need these kind of insights to have a deeper understanding also into what ahimsa means. So would anybody like to um, ask anything to this? If not, we can continue to the next verse.
So verse 22 says, As a man taking off worn out garments later puts on new ones. Similarly, the owner of the body, abandoning worn out bodies, enters other new ones. So here it is, it says very clearly, reincarnation. The moment you have an insight into the idea of pure consciousness, you have to draw the logical conclusion that there is something like reincarnation. If you say you do not believe in reincarnation because you have had no experience of it, what it ends up meaning is that you are an atheist because you do not believe in that one, that one divine that takes different forms. Often we do not understand the connection between the two. But saying that you do not believe in reincarnation means something like this is only one life here, I die and that's it, there's nothing more. When you say that, in a sense, you deny that pure consciousness in you. It is this pure consciousness which is manifesting in different forms. And the body is like a garment. And when one body is old, broken, you drop that body, you eventually take a new body. There may be a time between these two bodies where you rest. Eventually you take on a new body which, with which you can live out your samskaras. That is why we come to this plane, to live out our samskaras. If we would not have any samskaras to live out, you would not need a body. So the body is a very valuable instrument. So take care of it. It is your temple. Is the temple and the Atman is the deity. With a direct insight into this process, we lose our attachment to the body because you realize it is not so critical. You're not identified with it. You know that your clothes, however much you like your particular clothes, however expensive they may be, you know that if your clothes are damaged, you are not damaged, you are not harmed, you're still safe. Similarly, however broken your body may be, if it is damaged, it's hurt, still there is the self which remains pure, remains untouched, unharmed, and is eternal. It will never die. With that kind of insight, you see even your body very differently. You don't have that kind of identification at the body level that a lot of people do have. Understanding this theoretically does not mean that we are not attached to our body anymore. We can understand this as a philosophy, as a theory. But having the direct insight and being established in the self is, of course, a different level of consciousness. So 
we go on to the next verses. Verses 23 to 25. Weapons do not cleave him. Fire does not burn him. The waters do not wet him, nor does the wind dry him. He is uncleavable, unburnable, cannot be made wet, nor can he be made dry. The eternal, all permeating, absolute and unmoving, he is the ancient one. He is unmanifest, is not the subject of thought and is said to be incorruptible. Therefore, knowing him, it does not behoove you to grieve after anyone. So verses 23 to 25 are a description of Atman, of our true self, our true nature. So what is this Atman like? What is self, this self life or consciousness like? It's very hard to describe what it is. Some of the Upanishads refer to this as Sat Chit Anand. You say Sat Chit Anand means truth, Sat. Chit is consciousness and Anand is joy or bliss. So we describe it as Sat Chit Anand, truth, consciousness and joy. Yet some people are unable to understand it. So they say, oh yeah, but how is it? What is it, what is it like? The sages tried to find many ways to describe it, to indicate what it is like to those who have not had a direct experience of this. They made many efforts. Most of the times they found that the best way to describe it is in the negation. Neti neti, not this, not this. They said, no, is it like this? No, it's not. Is it like this? No, it's not. And so here we find that one of the best way to describe consciousness is by saying weapons cannot harm him. Cleave him means to cut. Fire cannot burn. The waters cannot wet you and the wind cannot dry this consciousness. So it sounds mysterious, sounds esoteric. What is such a thing? We don't know any such object. It is so subtle, it is so fine. If I ask you, what is freedom? What does this word? Can you see freedom? No. Can you see truth? Can you burn truth? Can you make truth wet? What about wisdom? Can we make wisdom wet? Can we dry wisdom? No, these are abstract ideas, very subtle ideas. These exist at a different, in a different realm. These are not objects at a material level. These are much finer. So these abstractions like wisdom, freedom, friendship, can we burn friendship? No. So these are abstract ideas. Consciousness is even finer than that. Just to give you an idea of what consciousness is like, it's something very subtle. It is not manifest. Verse 25 says, he is unmanifest. Consciousness is not manifest. When it manifests, then it takes a more grosser form in the form of the body or in the form of the world around us. That is consciousness manifesting. But if you know the unmanifest, then it does not behoove you to grieve after anyone. So the one who knows the unmanifest would not
not grieve after anyone because he knows it's all changing, these all forms that keep changing, but nothing is lost. It's a beautiful cycle of change, of birth, death and rebirth. If you see it as a beautiful cycle, you are referring to this from a point of view of Shakta, or you call that Shakti. The world is not an obstacle, it is Shakti, it is power, it is beautiful. If you view this from a perspective of obstacles, oh, the world is a place of suffering, it's terrible, then we call this Avidya or Maya. Collective ignorance is Maya. So, these three verses try to describe the undescribable. This is the closest we are going to get to understanding or to be able to get a feel of what pure consciousness is like. So if I may continue, we come to verses 26 to 28. Now, if you believe that this soul is born each time with the birth of a new body, or that it is eternal, or you believe that it dies upon the death of the body, even then, O oh mighty armed one, you should not grieve thus. The death of one born is definite, and the rebirth of one who is dead is also definite. Therefore, in such an unavoidable manner, matter, you should not grieve. O oh descendant of Bharata, beings have their beginning in the unmanifest, in the middle, they are manifest, and they end in the unmanifest. Indeed, what is there to wail about? So, Sri Krishna explains now that even if you believe that the soul is born and that it dies eventually at the death, time of death, you still need not grieve because one who is born will die, that's definite, and the one who dies will be reborn, that's also definite. It's unavoidable. Verse 28 is very important. It explains how from consciousness, which is unmanifest, we manifest, we appear, we materialize, we take a form and then we return to the unmanifest, that's called death. We rest and then we take a new form and that's called rebirth. So that which is unmanifest manifests and then goes back to the unmanifest. You can think of this as a book and this life is a chapter the only difference is that most of us don't remember the chapter before and you don't know the chapter which is going to come so life is like a book and this particular lifetime that you have is one chapter in the book. You do not know the beginning, you do not know the end. You do not know that un unmanifest part. This verse is a very important verse for those who aspire to 
to have a direct experience of the self for those who wish to to understand Shri Vidya, attain the peak of Shri Vidya, then this particular verse, 2.28, really is uh, one of the uh, highlights. Uh, when I first saw this verse, yeah. uh, you know, I, th I thought it is about the whole of uh, lifetimes together as manifest and then going back to the unmanifest. Uh, meaning that even when the body is not there but the Jeevatman is there, would it be possible to see that as manifest as well, the Jeevatman part? Mm. No, Ashish, um, I think the we have to understand the you know analyze this properly and understand the process clearly the jivatman is what we have right now it is manifest that's okay. the middle part that's the middle part that's the part in the middle they are manifest that's the jivatman and this process of jivatman going to sleep it is going back to consciousness so and that is unmanifest, is that, it? That is unmanifest. You are you are disembodied. You don't have a body. Right. So we are, we are looking at manifestation only in the terms of physical matter? Mm, yeah, you can say that in this gross sense. Yeah. Oh. Alright. Yeah. There is this matter of lokas, etc. But we don't want to go into that as yet. That's also a form of manifestation, but at a subtler level. So we keep it at this level here, that this life, as we know it now, is the manifestation of that unmanifest part, which is when we drop this body, the Jeevatman rests, and at some point of time it re-emerges, to attain another body. When we are sleeping, yes, there are locals, but that is a very, very, these are very subtle planes. Okay. All right. So, verses 29 to 30. One sees it as a wonder, another speaks of it as a wonder, yet another fears it as a wonder, and yet another hears of it as a wonder. But even someone hearing of it does not come to know it. This body bearer in everyone's body is eternally undestroyable, O descendant of Bharata. Therefore, you should not grieve after any and all beings. Here we see the importance of direct realization. People can speak of it. You can be even afraid of it, you can be in awe of it, you can hear about it. But none of this means that you know it. Knowing it, having that direct experience of it, is quite a different matter. This body bearer in everyone's body is eternally undestroyable. So don't grieve. So we may understand this theoretically, it may comfort us when we lose somebody dear to us. Yet it is not quite the same as when one knows it. So these two verses give us the importance of direct experience. This can all otherwise remain at a very, very theoretical level and even at the theoretical level, it can be comforting, 
but it still is then theoretical. So these two verses encourage us to seek direct experience. Don't I just wanted to ask uh, something here okay. that when we see this all as um, you know in this verse oh now it's gone oh sorry <laughs> I will scroll back to that yes here you are uh, therefore you should not grieve after any and all beings it it could be really misunderstood also that, you know, we take this as an excuse to not look after our families or after our dear ones. I think, it's, like you said, it's really important to, to make this distinction between the real insight and the way how we should behave if we have not reached that insight yet. Yeah. Um, so... It, it looks, it can look very abstract and, and give people the justification of how does it care, this world is anyway in such a chaos, how does it matter? Yes. But that's, I guess, not what, he, what is meant here. No. This is not meant to become a fatalistic approach or the idea of acceptance. I'm quite aware that in many yoga circles, people keep... You know, using this as a mantra, oh, you have to accept everything, you have to accept everything. But that's oh. not quite what is meant here. That, you know, you don't care, that you become insensitive to people or suffering, or you don't have, you know, you have become sort of like a little robot, you know, without emotions. That's not what is meant, you know. These are the popular or common misunderstandings. And that's why... These two verses caution us that you can speak of it and you can be amazed about it, you can even fear it, you can be in awe of it, but it is not the same as knowing it directly. It's very common that people misunderstand, misinterpret these verses and then they sometimes they behave very cold, insensitive, emotionless because they say, oh, hmm, you know, we don't have to grieve. It's okay, you know, the body is perishable. And these are what we talk about, those people, neo-advaitites, we refer to them as. They have this superficial knowledge, you know, this is the intellectual knowledge. And we can use these kind of lines and quote the Bhagavad Gita at the appropriate moment and we seem very wise and scholarly. But this is not true knowledge, true spiritual wisdom. This is superficial knowledge. We talked about this a few sessions ago when Krishna scolded Arjun. He said, this is pretended knowledge, what you are speaking here, these false words of wisdom. What were these false words of wisdom? He was, he was speaking like this, like he was wise, but this was just superficial knowledge. But deep spiritual knowledge does not mean you have no compassion. Quite the contrary, you will even feel more compassionate to the suffering of others. You may not grieve, but you can empathize in the grief of the others. Mm. You may, not, may be, you may be fearless, but you will still take care of your family or those who depend on you because you know that they uh, experience certain pain or suffering. Such a being is far more evolved. And such a being takes care of others. He becomes a guardian. Parents, for example, are guardians and take care of the children. We know that when the child cries because his sandcastle broke down, you might even be a little bit amused by it, but 
that you know for the child that sand castle was really important. It is temporary, it is going to break, we know that. Would you say that to the child? No, because you know that the sand castle is very important to the child. You may say instead, yeah, we'll come back again another day, we'll make a new one. You don't hurt the child. You're compassionate, you're loving. Because as a guardian of that child, you have compassion for the child. The child is still at the level of being attached to his sandcastle. As an adult, you have been through many, many experiences and you have learned to deal with the suffering. But the child has not. So, one who becomes a witness, who knows that the body is perishable, but the self is eternal, he becomes a guardian. Verses 31 and 32. Seeing your righteous duty, you should not tremble, for there is nothing better for a warrior than a righteous battle. Happy are the warriors who find such a battle that has come of its own momentum and is like an open door to heaven. So this is another beautiful um, verse or two beautiful verses here. If you find such a battle of its own momentum, what does it mean of its own momentum? I have often talked about this, that we all evolve. We are continuously evolving. We are in the process of evolving naturally. Irrespective of whether or not you practice yoga, any form of meditation or whatever it may be, you will still evolve. We have all gone through many, many lifetimes of evolution already. You know, our book has got many, has had many, many chapters before this one. And now, if you should be so fortunate that in this life, you have this battle what is the battle we are talking about? The battle where you are able to look at your own negative habit patterns and work with these. If you are able to do that, that is very auspicious. I've, I cannot think of any other word. It's very auspicious. This is the battle for the highest truth. This is the purpose of life. This is the purpose of all our lifetimes. It has culminated in this wonderful moment. It's like an open door. So it is not something you should run away from. You should welcome that. Because it's a great opportunity. It's a privilege. And that it should come to you of itself, on its own. Because you have gone through many times of evolution through the process. It's like a fruit that is ripened. So this is not something we need to be afraid of. This is not something we need to run away from. This is something we should welcome. So, verse 33, and if you will not do this righteous battle, 
then abandoning your duty as well as glory, you will be incurring sin. So why is he talking about sin here? I just said that if you have the opportunity to go through this internal battle, to resolve all your internal conflicts, then it's a great opportunity, privilege, it's very auspicious. But if you abandon this, you give up. You don't want to continue. That will be a sin. That's the only sin really. Is you sabotage your own development. This idea of sin is somehow very loaded, you know, with a lot of colouring. It's very tainted. So, let me explain it a little bit. The Sanskrit word is papam. Pap. Pap and punya. Some of us are familiar with that. Pap is bad karma and punya is good karma. Now, bad and good sounds very judgmental. So I will use the words from the Yoga Sutras. It goes white karma and black karma. There is a third kind which is mixed. It's black as well as white. If you do something for a purpose for yourself, it's actually black. It's black karma. Out of a selfish motive. If you do something totally selflessly, having absolutely no expectation, that is white karma. And when it is mixed, because you know, yes, there's a part that wants to really do something selflessly, but yet there's a part that says, oh, it would be nice to have something out of this, that's mixed. So if you do some charity, but you insist on having your name put on it, that good karma can become black karma, right? So sometimes you may have seen, you know, people donate park benches <laughs> and they have their name on it, donated by so-and-so. So they did some good deed, white, but then by putting their name on it, it becomes black. Most of the karma that we have, what we are doing throughout our day-to-day -day lives, daily lives, is mixed. There is a part we do for family, etc., which is selfless, but for others, sometimes we have our own ulterior motives. So this is the idea of black, white and mixed karma. This battle, this internal battle, it is not for the sake of anybody. It is white. It is your purpose of your life. It is the purpose of all of your lives. So when that moment comes, it has culminated in this moment where you can start this internal battle. But if you give up, you abandon it. You stop it. Then you are stuck, you will suffer, you will suffer and that is black karma. To put in very, very practical terms, what this means is that when you start meditation, because of your own accord, your own momentum, you have come to this point where you come to a teacher and you say, please teach me, teacher teaches you, you start practicing through meditation, you come to a point where you start seeing your negative qualities and then you say, oh, you know, um, these negative qualities are too much for me to look at, so I'm going to stop. I'm not going to meditate again. Well, this is what it would be, abandoning the battle. And if you do not continue, you get stuck. You do not develop it. You stop, stop your development. You're, you're stuck in your growth. And if you have a mind that's as sensitive as a yogi, 
a yogi's mind, as you know, Yoga Sutras 2.15, is as sensitive as the eyeball. Such a sensitive mind experiences this being stuck as something terrible, terrible suffering. So Swapna, Swapna is new, hello, haven't seen you here before. Say she asks, can I understand it like selflessness is punya and selfishness is papam? If I understand myself, my internal being is good. Um, I, I don't understand what you mean by the last, my internal being is good. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, the, the pure consciousness is always untouched. It is neither good nor bad. It is beyond dualities. When we talk about pap and punya, we are talking about living in this world of dualities. And therefore in this world of dualities, as long as you have a body, you live here, therefore you will have karma which is black or white or mixed. An action which you do without expectation is white, an action which you do with expectation is black or white most likely mixed. Okay, I hope you understood this um, verse 3. It's an important verse. It is motivating Arjun to continue, not to give up. Therefore, fight, Arjun. Don't give up. So, 34 to 37. People will be telling unglorious things of you forever. And such ill repute of someone once honored is worse than even death. The great commanders of chariots will believe you to have withdrawn from the battle out of fear. Having been such thought of, you will be belittled in their eyes. Those who wish you ill will speak much ill of you, despising your capacity. What can be more painful than that? Either having been killed, you will attain heaven, or having won, you will enjoy the earth. Therefore rise, O son of Kunti, making the decision to do battle. So in the first three verses, he is encouraging Arjun to continue, as a teacher would encourage his student who wants to give up meditation. A student comes to me and says, no, you know, I don't want to continue. This is too difficult for me. I think I'm not made for this. It's uh, too much, you know, going through this process and so much turmoil and uh, this is too much. I can't do it. What do you think I'd say? I would say, come on, how can you stop? Continue. And if I'm being very sneaky, like Sri Krishna is being here, he is telling him, you're a warrior. You have honor. What will the others think of you? You will lose, you know, your, your stature. Of course, you know, we should not be bothered too much about what others think, but most of the time we are. And... You don't want people to think that you gave up, you know. So this is the way he is motivating him, telling him, don't give up, continue. And then he says in verse 37, either having been killed, you will attain heaven, or having won, you will enjoy the earth. What does that mean? Having been killed, well, we are all going to die eventually. You're killing these negative qualities in you and maybe you do not succeed in killing them all. These negative qualities remain, but yet you die, you will attain heaven. Now this comes, that, that part comes, Ashish, where you, what you mentioned, the Jivatman. 
when we have not purified our samskaras completely, we have not attained moksha, we still have samskaras, we go to rest. We rest and this is where basically we live out our samskaras but at another level. It is like going to sleep at night. Yeah? We have dreams, we play out our desires, fears, all these things in our dreams. So death is like going to sleep, having dreams. Only difference is you don't have a body. So you're playing out these dreams. If you have purified to a certain extent, you have worked out some of those negative traits in you, some of those unhealthy habit patterns have been resolved, then you attain heaven. What is heaven? Heaven is when you have not that many negative thinking patterns. So it's basically being in the dreaming state. If you have a lot of negative thinking patterns, fears. Can you imagine you are having dreams about being chased, having dreams about being murdered, having dreams about snakes and spiders and other awful things which you're scared of all the time. Not just for a couple of hours, but really for a longer time. Well, that would be hell, right? That is hell. So heaven and hell are states of consciousness when we are disembodied. When these impressions of samskaras are pleasant, it's called heaven. When these samskaras or impressions are negative and unpleasant, that's hell. So if you have gone through the process of meditation and have purified and you, you don't succeed completely, you don't attain moksha, still you will attain heaven because you will rise to a higher plane of consciousness. Nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. Ever. In meditation. And if you win the battle, which means you attain the state of moksha, you resolve all your impressions, the pleasant as well as the unpleasant, the positive as well as the negative. You resolve all these samskaras. You are able to let go all of them. You have attained this um, sakshi bhav, the witness. You are now a witness. Then you will enjoy the earth. What does it mean to enjoy the earth? You become a jivan mokth. If you attain it right now in this body, you become a jivan mokth. You are a witness, you are here, you, you witness things and you can really enjoy. We can only enjoy our lives when we renounce. Renounce does not mean giving up material objects or thiaga in the sense of external renunciation. But renounce internally means... Don't be attached. Live in the moment, live in the present. And only one who is a witness can do that. And only such a one can really enjoy his life. And so he says, Therefore rise, O son of Kunti, making the decision to do battle. So he encourages him repeatedly throughout the text now, Therefore rise and fight. Don't give up. Continue this inner battle. We need guides like this when we haven't attained ourselves. We have not got access to that inner teacher, the guru within. Until then, you need such guidance from outside. You need an external teacher who will motivate you at all points of difficulty, turmoil, when you tend to go backwards, 
You want to give up meditation. It is not unusual. In fact, it's very common for those who start meditation coming face to face with one's negative qualities is sometimes such a shocking experience. This is what Arjuna experienced right in the first chapter. He got such a shock when he saw the armies <laughs> across symbolizing all his negative habit patterns. He got such a shock that he, he lost heart. And that's what happens. If you don't have the right guidance at that point of time, you end up thinking you're a bad person. You start identifying with those negative qualities. You lose hope. You give up. You remain stuck for a long, long time. There you suffer. And you need this kind of motivation and support from your guide, from your teacher, your counsel, your friend who is there for you doesn't fight the battles for you, but he is there for you, your companion, your sati. Okay, so I think on this wonderful note, we can stop. Therefore, rise, O son of Kunti, making the decision to do battle. I think we can stop at this point and we will continue. Uh, session next week. Would anybody like to ask anything before we stop? Any questions about this? Uh, Radhika, this uh, initial shlokas uh, that you uh, read on Advaita and vegetarianism. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was given to maybe assume that uh, your point was. Uh, that you know, uh, just don't make rules for the sake of you know uh, Advaitic, you know, without understanding Advaitic in detail, mm. just don't make rules like I, I become vegetarian. So once, if, if we truly understand, then we, it has to be realized internally, and you know, then then make a rule, uh, then then decide what is good for you at that point of time. So was it? Uh, can I take it that way or? Mm. Well, I am well aware that people are making rules and, and, and uh, becoming vegetarian. There's nothing against that. It's, it's good. They can become vegetarians. There's, there's nothing wrong in that. The point is uh, that we also need to have a deeper understanding. It should not remain a rule. There should be a deeper understanding behind it because sometimes these rules make us rigid. You know, we can also uh, be very judgmental about others who are not vegetarian then. And uh, that, uh, that is not very helpful. So if we understand the deeper meaning, which is Advaita, which is that we are all life forms having life, consciousness, uh, we are not as judgmental. And that's what I'm trying to say. Be compassionate. And the compassion is not only for the animals, it's also for other human beings. So uh, these rules can become uh, counterproductive sometimes. That was meant. Okay. Uh, yeah, Radhika ji, about this 34, 35, and 36. Yes. Uh, this 37 I understood about these three, 34, 35, 36. Mm -hmm. This talks about uh, uh, his own mental state. If he is uh, betrayed by or he is commented by the people, this is from the for the external world or for the internal world again. It's 34, 35, 36. If you see it, uh, if, people, uh, Katna, if, if, somebody, if I have a student and uh, the student is having difficulty in uh, understanding uh, certain practices, if the student is saying, I'm going to give up, you know, I, I can't continue because um, I'm not understanding or I'm understanding, but this is too difficult for me. Now, how, how can I encourage this person? So one way would be to say, if 
I, I would have such a student, I'd say, don't stop. If you stop, you, you know, what will others say? <laughs> you gave up so soon? <laughs> you know, how we do with children sometimes. They don't want to go to school or they don't want to do certain things. In sports, for example, we do that a lot. When you're in athletics or so, then we say, oh, you have to take part. If you don't take part, what will the others say? What will the others think? You know, you gave up so soon. So in a way, it is motivating the student, encouraging the student in a very clever way. You know, Sri Krishna was very clever. You know, we know that he was very cunning. Yeah. And he used his very uh-huh. clever ways to get his things done. So some people took it very negatively and said, oh, he was very manipulative. But he was not manipulative. He was seeing the things as they are. And in order to help people, sometimes uh-huh. he, he used such examples and say, hey, you know, you will lose your honor. You're a warrior. For warriors, that is very important, no? honor. So you, he's uh-huh. talking to him, but for, for understanding this is a symbol, and so we have to understand uh-huh. that it is a teacher who is telling a student, don't give up. Uh-huh. You, you should not give up. Yes. Yeah? Okay. All right. Yeah. So, Swapna, okay, thank you so much. Swapna asked, I would like to go through previous chapters. Uh, Swapna, these um, meetings are recorded and they are available on our YouTube channel. So, you can see the earlier chapters. They are also there. The channel is called That First English. So you can have a look. If you don't know it, are you in the Facebook group? Not sure. Maybe Joachim can quickly uh, give you the link. Yeah, hello, hello. Yeah. Radhika ji? Yes. Yeah, is Pranayam, Pranayam meetings are also recorded and not put on YouTube? Yes, Pranayam is also recorded. Yes, Pranayam is also recorded. Uh, Okay, the YouTube, uh, same name of the YouTube? It's the same channel, that first English. Uh, Joachim, okay. maybe you can just post the channel quickly now, if possible. Um, yeah, just a second. So for those who sometimes do not have time, though they are not posted immediately, they are posted after a few days, sometimes it takes a week. So uh, that depends then. Uh, oh, I posted it Yes. in the uh, chat. Yes, so you yeah. will see the Thank you so much. channel and you can subscribe to it. And we are uploading, as I have mentioned, um, Many videos coming up in the next one year, over 100 videos and clips. So, the previous sessions are all there, and so you can catch up on it. All right, everybody, thank you for being here, and we yeah, thank you so much. catch up next week. Thank you, Erika. Thank you, thank you, Radhika. Welcome, Aranda, Shanda. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, Matthew. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye, Sylvia. Bye bye, Sapna. I can hear a baby there. <laughs>